I'm going to talk about very basic, uh, simple Monte Carlo methods for computations on the POTS model. And uh, my, motiv my main focus is on in the low temperature regime and computations for the POTS in the low temperature. And the work is done with my colleague at Barcelona, Vicens Gomez, and some recent work with Andy Lolliger. Okay, so uh, we look at the problem of computing the partition function, which I denote by Z, of the POTS model. My assumption is that the POTS model is ferromagnetic, but the topology is arbitrary. Um, most of my slides are about two degrees, but you can generalize the technique for any graph structure. And I just have one, a few lines about the applications of the partition function of the POTS model in a statistical physics is important. Derivatives of Z are important. In graph theory is important related to chromatic pol polynomial graph coloring. I mean, it's not ferromagnetic, but it's POTS model. In image processing for image segmentation and denoising has applications. And we use uh, Monte Carlo methods to draw samples according to a target distribution, which in this case is called the Boltzmann distribution. This can be done with Gibbs sampling or swenson wang algorithm. And then we use these samples to, to estimate the partition function. And we use uh, factor graphs to represent the, the distribution. And mainly we focus, focus on Fournier factor graphs. Then we look at the dual of the Fournier factor graph, which has the same topology as the original graph and the same partition function up to a scale factor. And then we want to know, can we estimate Z more efficiently with Monte Carlo methods in the dual factor graph? And of course, I'm interested in cases that this computation is difficult uh, in the primal domain and the main one major problem is computing it in the low temperature regime where computations are harder than high temperature regime. So here are the basic uh, two simple, very simple Monte Carlo methods. We have n variables or particles. I denote x1 through xn. x is a vector and each of them takes their values in a finite alphabet script x. And I have two positive functions from the status space in this status space and according to them I define two probability mass functions. One is P and the other one is Q. And the normalization constant of P is Z, which I want to compute. And suppose I have another distribution, Q, PMF on this state space. But this one, ZQ is known, or I know how to sample from Q. So I don't really care about Q. I assume that Q is a function that I know how to sample from. I know how to compute its partition function, but for P, I don't know. I want to compute its normalization constant. And here are two very basic uh, sampling techniques. The first one is that you take L samples according to, the, to Q, uh, which in this case uh, is not the distribution I'm interested in, is P where I sample from Q. And Q is usually called the auxiliary distribution or proposal distribution. Then to estimate Z, I sum over F over Q, <coughs> at each point that I sample, and this is an unbiased estimator for Z, and it's important sampling. The other way is that you take L samples according to P, which I know up to scale is F, and then you sum over inverse of F multiplied by Q at each uh, point, and then this is an unbiased estimator for one over Z. And both, is estimate, both of them are bad estimators, but for the sake of comparisons that we want to do are are enough for us. So this is the POTS model that I uh, define now with pairwise interactions. We have again n variables. And the state space is x is uh, integer 0 to up to q minus 1. And q is bigger equal to 2. Uh, it's slightly easier for me if you consider x as the abelian group zq, because I have lots of arithmetic uh, additions in the, between the variables and I don't want to write every time mod q, mod q. So if I forget mod q, you know that all the mani arithmetic manipulations are in zq. And q is bigger than 2. If q is 2, it's, it's basically the Ising model. 
And the interactions are between neighbors, xk and xl, and associated with adjacent variables, there is a coupling which is jkl. And the distribution I want to, I'm interested in is the Boltzmann distribution, which is a product over all the adjacent variables, and it has the following form. So if xk and xl neighbors are the same, it takes e to the power j divided by t, where t is the temperature, otherwise it's one. What do you mean with adjacent? Means they have pairwise interaction between them. So xk and xl are interacting with each other. But when you say you restrict it to adjacent, isn't adjacent meaning the ones that interacting isn't this self-referential? I'm sorry? You say interaction restricted to adjacent, but how is it adjacent different? Adjacent are the ones for which jkl is not zero. So you have two, you have xk and xl, and between them there is a factor that is. Yeah, so that's what it means that they interact, but what does it mean adjacent? I think you just scratched the adjacent. Yeah, you probably didn't yeah, just the product or not. Uh, product not over all x, over all xk, xl, yes. I mean, if it's grid, then XK, all, not all xk and xls are interacting. Only neighbors are interacting. Do it, tell me that adjacent means they interact. But yes. You're saying interaction of adjacent. So you, you, you're defining adjacent in terms of interaction, but interaction in terms of. Yeah, interaction is adjacent. Okay. <laughs> and t is the temperature, and I set t equal to 1. So I ignore that temperature. And my model is ferromagnetic, meaning that this, these couplings are all positive. So with this setup, if J is large, it means I'm at low temperature. If J is small, it means that I'm high temperature. So instead of playing with T, I play with J. That's uh, OK. So now, for each configuration X, I can compute the Boltzmann distribution up to a scale factor Z. And Z is just sum over this product of the factors. So if you give me a configuration, I can compute P, but up to scale of factor Z. But my interest is basically computing the normalization constant, or the log of it, which is the free energy. OK, so before actually I start, I show <coughs> four slides to, to see how high temperature, low temperature contrast between them. This is a 5 by 5 three-state POTS model, Q is 3. And at high temperature, we use uniform sampling and we use the Gibson, Swenson, and Wang to draw samples according to the, this one for, to draw samples according to P and this one is simple uniform sampling. And uh, this is a very small model, you can do it brute force, but you see that you have good convergence after a couple of thousand samples. And if you go to low temperature, you see that it, convergence is very bad. So up to 10 to the power 7, which is almost the size of the state space, you don't see any convergence. And if you go to the dual graph, which I describe later, at high temperature you see that convergence is bad, but at low temperature you see that convergence gets better. So this is again Gibbs sampling and uniform sampling in the dual domain. So this, you see that there is a contrast between them. Okay, so now I have this factorization of the Boltzmann distribution, which I denote by F. Now I represent f with a factor graph and explain my Monte Carlo methods on the on this factor graph. Any any questions so far? Okay, so the graphical model I use is uh, like what Henry explained yesterday, but with a slight difference. Uh, I have a function which is has a factorization, but I use Fourney's notation, meaning that nodes are represented by fact factors are represented by nodes and variables by edges. So here, factor F A is a function of x1, x2, x5. So these edges are attached to it, meaning that these are arguments of F A. And if there are more than, if a variable appears in more than two factors, like this case, then I use an equality indicator factor with equality sign, meaning that x2, x2 prime, and x2 second, they're all the same. So uh, this is a factorization, a Fourney factor graph for this factorization that you have up there. So if you want to use the uh, factor graph notation, 
this equality constraint just becomes a node, which is a variable node. So instead of defining variable nodes and factor nodes, I define uh, variables on the edges, but if sometimes I have to add this equality constraint to make it, make it work. And these equality constraints just force these variables to be the same. So x2, x2 prime, and x2 second, they're all the same because this factor is defined as, as delta function. And uh, this is a Kronecker delta, Kronecker delta in the discrete st space. And uh, for example, you might have, this is a uh, factor that appears also in my talk, which is a uh, zero sum factor or mod q factor, for example. And it forces all the variables, some of them to be zero. So in this case, my uh, arithmetic manipulations are in zq, so it means that it, this factor is one if the addition of them is zero mod q, otherwise it's zero. Okay, so now with these uh, definitions, this is a 2D POTS model factor graph of the 2D POTS model. You have uh, these factors between adjacent the interacting variables and they have the following form. If they are the same, e to the power j, otherwise one. And you have all these equality constraints that forces these variables to be the same. And again, transforming it to a normal factor graph is easy. Just remove all these equalities and put variable nodes. But here, variables are on the edges and factors are on the nodes. So you have a separation between them. And now I define the dual. Actually, I don't have, uh, I only have two, three slides to explain this duality uh, because first of all, I, it takes time to prove it. I have graphical proof and it's not complete, but uh, gives the idea. Uh, essentially, everything in terms of factor graph goes back to Forney's paper, normal realization of graphical models. And you can see it as a special case of gauge transformation, which is uh, very well known in statistical physics. I cited this paper, but it goes back behind, before that in the literature. And recent people show that it's also related to holographic algorithms in computer science. So here is, uh, again, my factor, a factor graph. I explain a couple of manipulations on this graph that uh, keep the value of the partition function unchanged. So for example, if you have a factor here, fc, which is a function of x3, x4, and x5, and you have fb, which is a function of x2 and x3, you can define a box here, g, a factor g, which is a function of x4, x2, and x5. And if you replace it by marginalizing out the variables that are inside, and you replace this box with g, the partition function will not change. And also the other way around. If you have g, you might define an internal variable x3, and if this condition is satisfied, again, the partition function will not change. So this is what people call uh, vertex merging, splitting, or opening the box, closing the box. These manipulations do not change the value of z. Now I have a factor graph which has these uh, factors kappa related to the POTS model. I can replace it with the Fourier transform of this kernel, which I denote by gamma, but surrounded by the inverse Fourier transforms. And this, again, will not change the value of the partition function. And I might continue that by merging these inverse Fourier transforms with the equality constraints and close this box. And again, this will not change the value of the partition function, uh, up to scale. And from the original graph that you had here, you go back to the other graph, and these are the 2D Fourier transforms, discrete Fourier transform of the kernels, and these are the inverse Fourier transforms of the equalities, which I denote by plus factor. So this factor graph and this factor graph are completely different, but they have the same partition function. So let's apply it to the, to the POTS model and see what happens. So the kernels in the POTS model, again, have this form. You take the 2D Fourier transformation on this factor and you get gamma factor. And I use tilde for the variables in the dual domain. So if they are both zero, it takes value ej plus q minus one. If the sum of them is zero, which is again mod q, it takes ej minus one, otherwise it's zero. 
So for example, if Q equals to three, then you have this kernel in matrix form, maybe it's easier. You have this kernel in the primal domain, which on the diagonal you have E's, E to the power J's, and otherwise you have one. If you take the Fourier transformation of this uh, 2D Fourier transformation of this matrix, you get Ej plus two, which is Q minus one, Ej plus Q minus one here. And whenever the sum of them is zero, you get Ej minus one. So at points two, one, and one, two, you get these factors, otherwise you get zero. So this is a factor you get in the dual domain. And now you have to take the inverse Fourier transform of the equality constraint. And let's suppose the equality constraint is between four variables, x1, x2, x3, x4, meaning that they are the same. So this takes value one if x1, x2, x3, x4 are equal, otherwise it takes zero. And if you take the inverse Fourier transform, it becomes delta of x tilde one plus x tilde two plus x tilde three plus x tilde four. Meaning that this is zero unless the addition of them is zero mod Q, up to scale factor Q. So now I can actually, from this graph, which is the primal domain, I can go to the dual domain, and this has the same partition function, but completely different graph with different variables and different factors. And the factors are again between variables x1, x2, is, has this form, and these plus signs meaning, means that these variables that are attached to the plus signs, the addition of them has to be zero mod Q. And for example, if in this case, if you have an Ising model, then it means that the addition of them should be zero mod two, which is an XOR factor. But here is more general. Okay, so now my goal is to compute the partition function of this graphical model and see what happens. So uh, I do one simple modification on this graph. Now we see that this factor is always zero unless either both are zero or the addition of them is zero. So in that sense, you really don't need two variables to define this factor. One variable is enough because the other one is always the negative minus the other one. So you can equally represent it like this. Meaning that you only define one variable here, x1, let's say x1 tilde, and the factor on that one is ej plus q minus one and ej minus one. If it's zero, otherwise it's ej minus one. But the variable which is on the other side is always the negative of the other one, so I use this small circle to show that it's the negative of the other one. I mean, I'm not very happy with the notation, but it's like the NAND gate that you, the other side is the negative of this side. So basically what we are saying here is that since your factor is and this is x1 and this is x2, you can marginalize x1 because at each row everything is zero unless except for one term. If you marginalize over x1, you get ej plus q minus one, ej minus one, ej minus one, etc. And this is the bias you have over x1. And x2 is simply minus x1. So we use one variable, so we, use, we need also one index for j. So that is, that is my, again, the graphical model that I have. So now again, if I compute the partition function here, it's the same as the original graph. Okay, now, this graphical model in the dual domain has lots of plus signs, which forces the variables that are attached to them to have value zero when you add them mod Q. So not all the variables in this graph are independent. Indeed, if you assign values to some edges, the other ones are deterministic according to the other ones. And uh, it, uh, it's easy to see that if you look at a spanning tree on this graph, which I have tick edges for that. Is it clear the tick edges from where you are? If you assign values to the edges outside of the spanning tree, the spanning tree is deterministically known. And this is basically how you encode the cycle code, for example. So I look at this spanning tree. I assign values to the edges that are outside. And from them, I can compute the edges on the tree. 
So for example, here I put 0, 2, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 2, 0, 2. And if this is 0, this bit is also 0. 2 plus 0, this one should be 1 to make sure that this constraint is satisfied. So you can independently choose the variables outside of the spanning tree and then compute the spanning tree. And uh, starting from leaves, you can then recursively compute everything. And then on the spanning tree, I denote the variables x by xp. And on, outside of the spanning tree, I denote them by xa. And the factors that you have on the spanning tree, I denote them by multiply them, and I denote the big gamma b for the variable factors that are outside. And the ones that are outside are gamma a, and the ones that are on the tree are gamma b. So that is the. Now, if you define everything on the a part, b part is deterministically known. OK, now this is my important sampling algorithm. The distribution that I use as auxiliary distribution is the product of everything outside of the tree divided by ZQ. But this distribution has uh, nice properties. First is that ZQ is known. You can analytically compute it. Because these bits you can, variables you can independently set to whatever you want according to any distribution. Now I choose this distribution and these ones. Now the partition function of this one is the partition function over this edge, this edge, this edge, and then you multiply them together. So the partition function on each of them is ej plus q minus 1. And you have q minus 1 degenerate eigenvalues, which gives you, and this gives you q ej. And you have to multiply this over all the edges that are outside of the spanning tree. The size of them is the size of A. And e to the power j's is you just sum the edges, the couplings that are outside of the tree. And this is the partition function. And the other thing is that you can actually draw independent samples from Q. The way you, we do it is we look at each of the factors, let's say x1. The probability that this variable is 0 is ej plus q minus 1 divided by the, the whole partition function. So you draw uniform sampling, uniform random numbers on the edges outside of the tree. If it's a smaller than this quantity, you set it to 0. Otherwise, the other ones have the same probability. So you just randomly pick a number between 1 and q minus 1 because they have the same mass at this point. And then this way you can draw samples according to Q. And these samples are independent. That's actually another nice property. And you do this L times. You collect L samples. Whenever you have XA, XB is deterministically known from XA. And then your important sampling algorithm is extremely easy. You just have to divide F by Q and if you divide f by q, the only part that remains is the b part, because a part was already in the important sampling distribution. And this is an unbiased estimator for, for z. So this, if you take l samples, this, as l goes to infinity, it converges to the partition function. And uh, there is some intuition behind this, but just to make sure that this works at low temperature, we show that if j goes to infinity, the normalized mean square error of this important sampling algorithm goes to 0. And you can see the opposite in the primal domain. If j goes to 0, the variance of these important sampling algorithms goes to 0. And a stronger statement is that if the, the couplings outside of this, uh, on the spanning tree, go to infinity, Again, the variance of this important sampling algorithm goes to 0. So in this case, if you have, oh, sorry. If you have the couplings on the spanning tree, which is the tick one, they go to infinity, then the variance of this estimator is 0. OK, any questions about the sampler? Because I just have some time. I want to show some numerical experiments. Uh, the last slide I have is that 
This important sampling algorithm has one layer, one level. So you might assume that this works very bad if dimensions goes large or the temperature is not very low. If in that case, you have to mix it with uh, sequential Monte Carlo methods or annealed importance sampling and uh, other techniques simulated tempering. I just write the way it's done by annealed importance sampling. Let's assume that I want to compute the partition function at couplings are j, let's say they're constant. The temperature is low, but not very low. So what you do is that you express it as a product of ratios of partition functions. You start from very low temperature and gradually go to a temperature which is low, but not too low. And this one is easy to compute because it's at very low temperature, but the other ones, these ratios, you can also compute and then you go to the partition function that you want. And the way people do it in the primal domain is that you start from the temperature and you decrease your temperature to high temperature. Here we do it the other way around. We go from mid temperature all the way to very low temperature because at very low temperature we know how to compute it. So this sequence that you, you see here as powers and the J is an increasing sequence and not a decreasing sequence where people use in the primal. And uh, this is the conclusion. <coughs> So we use factor graph duality and we show actually some numerical results come later that it works very well at low temperature. And if you have more challenging cases, you just use annealing or sequential methods to make it work. And the nice property that they have is that if temperature goes to inf zero, meaning that couplings go to infinity, the normalized variance goes to zero. And even nicer, not all of them should go to infinity. On the spanning tree, if they go to infinity, that's enough. Again, the variance, normalized variance goes to zero. And I insisted that this graph is, this POTS model is ferromagnetic because the factors that I have have this special form, Ej plus Q minus one and Ej minus one. If Js are negative, meaning that you have a, a spin glass or anti-ferromagnetic Ising model, then this factor becomes negative. And in that case, uh, I, this important sampling algorithm will fail because I can't define a distribution, a PMF on this state space. So this is a, an open question, how to, we can generalize them to more interesting cases where couplings can be both negative and positive, which is also more interesting for people who do uh, learning and machine, machine learning computations. And uh, finally, uh, sometimes Z is important, but sometimes the more important quantity is the derivatives of Z. And these techniques do not really show, a tech, show a, how to compute, for example, the internal energy or magnetization. But uh, you can, if you can compute Z with good accuracy, then you can also compute the derivatives with respect to temperature. But it would be nicer to get techniques that can directly give you these quantities. So. Uh, this is the end of my presentation about the, the, the algorithm. And I just show, the, show some numerical experiments that we actually finished recently, if there are, if there are no questions about the, the method. So I was just wondering, I asked Pedro about the duality that you use. It's not the same as the comments that you use when Q equals to well, actually, that is something I'm not sure about. This is a question for Pascal. I think actually the, the way I, the, as far as I know, that uh, duality that people use uh, in the form that you see is only for infinite grids. Okay, but apart from that, I mean, so graphs when they it's two steps. You do this and then Yes. So I mean we have this uh, paper that I said here last year.
body of the shop should be. So here, if you apply to the standard physics model on a square body, say, this you are yeah. do, you, do you get again these models on the square grid with a dualized temperature or not quite? Essentially, I mean, you have to, I don't remember, somehow you take, need to take care of it now. Yeah, okay, but forget yeah. about, let's say, an infinite grid or yeah. a periodic uh, bumper condition. So, I mean, it's only what they show back then, you're from easing, you get to easing, no? Yes, this is the rule of the other two So, here you get. You go from easing to easing also? Well, that is not a, that is not a POTS model anymore. The, why the, the, this graph... Uh, no, but suppose you apply your method to the easing model. Yes. I don't think so. You get a model which has no physical interpretation, okay. but so its partition so function is the same. But so then it's not quite the same as the study. I don't think so. Kramer study has two steps. Is this plus something else? Yes. I mean... The, I mean, the samples I get from this graph don't mean anything in terms of... Uh, okay. yeah. The second step is that they are going from a generator matrix to a parameter matrix. Okay, so... Okay, we considered two cases. Uh, Three-state POTS model the periodic boundary conditions and the size on a grid is eight by eight. And we also considered a fully connected graph with 15 nodes. <coughs> and this was actually the largest size I could solve exactly with junction tree algorithm. If beyond that, I couldn't do it with my, with my desktop. And for fully connected graph, uh, probably we could go up to 20 maybe, but that's enough 15 to show the contrast between the computation. So here is a, uh, the relative error, I know the exact value of the partition function z. So I compute the difference between the, my estimation and the exact value divided by the exact value as a function of the coupling parameter. And I use, for all the temperatures, I use 10 to the power 8 samples in my dual computations. So this blue curve is my important sampling, relative error of an important sampling algorithm. And then you see BP and GBP plots. And at, at high temperature, you see that they actually perform well, so there is no point using duality. But in the low temperature regime, this works like one, two orders of magnitude better in terms of relative error. And actually, three expectation algorithm works uh, pretty well in this case, too. So, uh, and of course, if you increase L, this plot will improve. And then here, we did something uh, more random on a fully connected three-state POTS model with 15 nodes. We took the couplings from a normal distribution with variance sigma squared. But to make sure that the model stays ferromagnetic, we took the absolute value of the value that we can do. That's what I mean by this ugly notation. And again, L is equal to 10 to the power 8. And here you see actually more improvement. Uh, GBP works extremely well at high temperature. So the relative error is order 10 to the power minus 7, 8. But in the low temperature regime, all of these techniques are very bad. And the dual domain works two to three orders of magnitude better than the, uh, all these variational methods. And uh, of course, if you continue your simulation, these, uh, these, they all converge to a fixed point and they don't improve. But if you increase L, we expect this blue curve to go even lower. And, well, I didn't say anything about the ex external field, but uh, uh, if you add an external field, our methods actually do not work very well. So if you have a very ex small external field, Still, this important sampling algorithm is okay, but if the external field becomes larger, then uh, usually these variational methods like BP and GBP perform very well. So the symmetry is broken, and uh, you don't need really to do any Monte Carlo methods. That is, GBP, especially GBP, performs extremely well when you have a little external field. But if the external field is very, very small, still they perform well, but quickly when you increase H, they, they behave very bad. And for a larger grid, uh, this is a four-state POTS model. The size is 30 by 30. 
And outside of the spanning tree, I chose couplings independently, uniformly between 0 0.75 and 225. So it's a somehow mixture of low and high temperature. But on the spanning tree, I chose them extremely high. And this is how it converges after 10 to the power, is that seven or eight? Seven. Up to 10, 10 to the power seven samples, you see actually some convergence. But if you again increase the couplings on the spanning tree, you see that convergence improves. So with uh, 30 by 30 grid, the state space is 4 to the power 1,200. And after 10 to the power 4 or 5 samples, you can get a good estimate of the partition function. And independent of what happens outside of the tree, if you increase this JB, your convergence keeps on improving and improving. So you can continue this plot, and you see that convergence gets better. OK, I think I. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. So the external field, like, um, how does that affect the, the duality? Is it just cut off completely, or does it? Um, well, actually, it's a little tricky to add it, but uh, that's why I didn't want to put it because it takes okay. more time to. It's not. A, it's a little annoying when you add this field in the dual domain. Um, so, and it doesn't perform well, so there was no really point to discuss it further. Uh, does, it, does, it get, does this magnitude of the field get flipped over as well? Or is it, is it no, actually, again, you have to be careful about that too. That's a very good point. So this is when you add an external field. Uh, so if you add an external field, then in your graphical model, you have couplings between x1 and x2, but then these are also affected by the external field, right? This so is the field. You can treat the external field just as a separate like, observation for each. Yes, but then you have to take the Fourier transform of this one too. Okay, exactly. But then it's one dimensional Fourier transform. Okay. So you have to add it, and then these factors that you see here are the one dimensional Fourier transforms of the external field. But uh, it's a little tricky because uh, the the independence between variables will also change. So that's why I didn't want to go through the details. But again, you cannot use these techniques if the external field is sometimes positive, sometimes negative, because again, you have negative factors. So they should be all positive, for example, or all negative. But it's, uh, I don't know if I didn't put the, I think I don't have any slides about that. So your simulations, you have uniform fields? I don't have any external field. This no, No, they do, the plots I showed, H was constant. 0 0.05, so 0. Point, yes, so there but positive. Problem. Sorry? So if there you have issues. If the field is extremely small, no. They work better than BP and GBP. But if you increase it, yeah. then if you, if you increase it, these bits are really uh, take the value that the external field is dictating to them. So there is really no point in simulating it. Yes? Do you have any additional cost looking at the dual version? Not really. I mean, the cost that you have is basically uh, you have to draw samples independently on these edges that are outside of the tree, which is uh, depends on the OE size of the edges. Once you have these samples, you just have to do some additions in mod Q to compute the other ones. And the computation you do at the end is, is, uh, is a summation over the product of the kernels that are outside of the tree. So if you do GIP sampling, you also have all these uh, computations. Because you draw a sample, then you have to compute the unnormalized Boltzmann distribution over, over those samples. So this is essentially exactly the same, but only on outside of the spanning tree. Uh, sorry, inside the spanning tree. I don't think computationally, it's the, the computation is not the issue. I mean, it's, it's the same as what you do in the primal domain. I mean, actually, in some cases, you might even, 
uh, get some advantage here because this summation on the B part is, is uh, actually uh, on the spanning tree, right? B part is the spanning tree. So when we did the numerical experiments on the fully connected graph, it was extremely fast because the spanning tree has only n minus 1 edges, while the graph has O n squared edges. So, so it depends on the structure of the graph, but in, for a grid, I don't think there is. Is there any phase conditions phenomenon in? in but I, I, in, analytically, I don't know. Hmm? But if you start decreasing, increasing the temperature, there is some point that doing it on the original primal graph is better than doing it on the original graph. For a finite graph, you have to probably do it numerically to see where they get worse and better. But uh, the tr phase transition of this model is known. Uh, I don't remember, square root of Q minus one or something like that. So we know in the fi infinite grid where the phase transition happens. But for the finite grid, uh, I don't know if it's easy to know, but the best case is to compare at some mid temperatures to see which one is now performing better or worse and choose which one is, is better. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And it's uh, 340 is, is seen for sales. Okay.